I have to tell you that I'm rather glad that um, we've ordered things tonight to deal with apostasy first and the cross second. I'd rather go out talking about the cross than going out talking about apostasy. This, um, this subject uh, that we deal with in this first hour is not a happy one. Uh, it's not intrinsically happy, and in any case, uh, I'm sure it won't be long before some of you are going to wish that um, we had a, a discussion session after this one um, to um, air your disagreements, uh, b because there are a few passages in the New Testament that generate more disputes than uh, Hebrews 6 and 10. The, the wise course here again is to begin by a reading of the sacred text. And so I'm going to read from 5.11 to the end of 6. Now, in fact, our focus is 5.11 to 6.12. But I will make a few comments on 6.13 to 20. And now I would like to read the entire section, 5.11 to 6.20, the end of 6. This is what scripture says. After introducing Melchizedek as a figure and a theme, the author writes, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And, God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Because to their loss... They are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope Sure, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so, after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised, Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm 
and sure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. It doesn't take much experience of the Christian way to observe various instances of falling away from the gospel. There are many different forms of it. The 18-year-old brought up in the secure embrace of a Christian family and a steady church sometimes goes off to university and A year, two years, three years later, hits the skid and comes home and is very proud of his or her renegade agnosticism. Or one finds the nominal Christian who has uh, apparently walked with the Lord and taught Sunday school classes for many years, gradually drifting away, snookered by the high-pressure job, uh, the need to be promoted to the level of partner, the lust for yet a bigger house and one more boat and whatever. Or the person who has been rejected by a mate or lost a child at the age of three to cancer, is now now sunk in in, in endless waves of deep bitterness and and tremendous hurt, uh, turning around and lashing out at God. Many of these, of course, eventually come back. Sometimes even rather shocking ones. The 18-year-old brilliant agnostic, eventually marries, has children of his own, begins to wonder what's going to control their future, remembers the teachings of his youth, and and genuinely is converted at the age of uh, 28. We've all seen it again and again, haven't we? For all that we believe that God can save anyone at any age, Uh, Nevertheless, the children of our own home sometimes we're not entirely sure about until they've left home for a few years and are making decisions on their own. My youngest leaves home this year, and I say to myself, here we go again. I think that the gospel is truly in him, but um, ask me in three or four more years. I know of a, of a pastor, I never met the man, but he served a reformed church in Arkansas 25 years ago, and about the age of 50, uh, he uh, abandoned his wife, declared that he was a homosexual, uh, lost his ministry, of course, and 10 years later, repented deeply, was reconciled to his wife, and actually died in the bosom of the church that he had pastored. He never held public office again, but uh, you can go to that church today and uh, still see the man's library. And then there are still more disturbing cases. I haven't hit the hard ones yet. When I was a young man at seminary, I knew a pastor who was already an old man by the name of Vince Trimmer. And he told me that when he was a young man, he had been serving a church in uh, Chicago. And uh, at this time, I was in Toronto. He was in Toronto. And uh, Vince Trimmer said that at this time, he had organized uh, in, in the fashion of the day and from, from his background in, in devout um, uh, dispensationalism, he, 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 he wanted to organize a citywide crusade, as they were still then called. There were really two national leaders in this business that he could appeal to, and they eventually opted for one, the most prominent, the more gifted, the person who had a better track record of seeing decisions. He said the first hint that something was wrong came when the man arrived on the first night and asked where his dressing room was. The man's name was Charles Templeton. A Canadian, now an old man. I don't think he's died yet. He must be pretty close. He did pass away, yeah. Um, he, he, he abandoned the faith shortly thereafter when he was a student at Princeton. And um, 
gradually, although he was, he was courteous toward Christians for many years, toward the end he became an extremely bitter, nasty old man. The young man who was rejected by Vince Trimmer and his crew was just breaking out on the scene. His name was Billy Graham. And then, of course, some of you will know that one of my best friends on God's green earth three years ago, uh, perhaps the ablest preacher I have ever heard, and I've heard a lot, an astonishingly gifted man who has seen thousands converted and I don't know how many built up in the faith, abandoned his wife of 29 years and declared himself to be a homosexual and um, has left devastation everywhere in his wake. And his mission today is to expand the horizons of evangelicalism to accept homosexuality as a legitimate option. Wesley freed the slaves. He will free the homosexuals. What shall we make of these? What category applies? When we try to think our way through biblical examples, we do not find instantaneous help. It's not that there is no help. We do not find instantaneous help because there is such an array of different kinds of examples. Not infrequently in the Old Testament, for example, apostasy, I will now use the term generically for a turning aside, whatever is bound up with that turning aside. Apostasy is sometimes configured as spiritual adultery. One can see the parallels. In both cases, there's a breaking of, of covenantal vows, of loyalty, of fidelity, and so forth. And some of the biblical language on this subject will sear your eyeballs. Y you don't really want, I suspect, in most of your churches to read Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23 out loud in public. And then you come to Hosea, and there God is presented as the almighty cuckold. It's astonishing, really. Or in such cases, you're dealing with the whole people of God facing judgment because of covenantal apostasy, turning away from where they were. But there are also some rather shocking individual instances, aren't there? Samuel, prohibited by God Almighty from praying any longer for Saul. Don't pray for him, seeing that I've rejected him. Too late. That's pretty shocking, too. Have you ever got to the place where you concluded, all right, mustn't pray for this one anymore now, just pray against him? And then, aren't you driven to ask sometimes why this one and not that one? The sons of Korah commit terrible sin. They're destroyed. Moses defies God Almighty, and he doesn't get into the promised land, but he's still a man of great uh, virtue and praise and so on everywhere in Scripture. What would you make of an ostensible Christian who arrogantly tells the Lord Jesus what to do contradicts his theology, later disowns him, and swears violently that he never knew him. What would you do with him? Hmm? Well, his name's Peter. And he becomes the primus inter pares, the first amongst evils in the o e evils, equals. <laughs> Freudian slip. In the opening days of the Christian church. What, what would you do with, with, uh, with another man who, uh, uh, he, he makes one terrible mess, and he was not always a bit loose in his accounting, but on the other hand, he was a, a powerful witness, performed miracles, uh, uh, never actually disagreed with, with the content of, of, of Jesus, so far as we know. His name is Judas. And it is said of him that it would have been better of him if he had never been born. The scriptures are full of encouragements to press on, to pre persevere, to stay the course. And they offer many warnings against falling away, against moving from a position on which once one once stood. 
Technically, that is all apostasy is, the moving away from a position on which one once stood. It is apo stasis. You were on a certain position, and now you move away from it. Technically, at least etymologically, that's all that apostasy is. But that won't do as a definition for the very simple reason that it is far too neutral. You see, in that sense, you could call Paul an apostate. He moved away from the position of Judaism to become a Christian. So he was an apostate to Judaism. You see, he moved away from a position he once held. But there's nowhere in the New Testament that refers to Paul as our beloved apostate because of this, do you see? Apostasy itself has overtones that are far more serious, and the relatively few places where that word or related terms uh, are used invariably bespeak something fearsome, something horrible. Apostasy takes on in the New Testament deeper, bleaker dimensions. Granted, then, how prevalent in the New Testament are encouragements to persevere and warnings not to fall away, we should not be surprised to find such themes in Hebrews. Indeed, we've already come across such passages, haven't we? The excursus in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. It's embedded in the passage on the nature of Scripture in chapter 4, 12 to 13. Then there's this one, and perhaps still starker yet, the great one in chapter 10. But there are two features of the warning passages in Hebrews that are especially noteworthy. They are not found everywhere in the New Testament, but they are particular to Hebrews. Not exclusive to Hebrews, but, but uh, peculiarly emphasized in Hebrews. Number one, the peculiar apostasy dealt with in this book is not toward hedonism, not toward relativism, not toward atheism, not toward postmodernism, it is toward Judaism. It is a going back to the earlier revelation at the expense of abandoning the exclusive sufficiency of Christ. The closest parallels, probably in the New Testament, are found in Galatians, although the language is quite different. The second thing to observe is that there is an enormous gravity to the apostasy in this book, characterized itself by two things. First, the emphasis on the seriousness of this falling away, precisely because this gospel is the climactic gospel. Hence the ratcheting up argument, the a fortiori argument in chapter 2. If that covenant produce such massive curses, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? There is a ratcheting up that appears again and again and again throughout the book. Chapter 10 is positively blistering in this respect. And because of that, secondly, the seriousness works out unambiguously in saying that there is no return from this falling away. There is no return. You, you take the man in 1 Corinthians 5 who's sleeping with his stepmother, and the apostle Paul himself doesn't know how it's going to turn out. He wants discipline not only to preserve the purity of the church. He knows perfectly well that a rotten apple can spoil the whole barrel. He uses a similar analogy himself. Or a little leaven can, can make the whole dough rise. But at the same time, he wants it for the man's own sake. This is to be done in the hope that his spirit will be saved in the last day. And the language quite clearly means that Paul doesn't know how this one's going to turn out. But here, the whole emphasis is, if you fall away in the order of things that I'm depicting, chapter 6 and chapter 10, there is no hope. None. Thus, the argument in chapter 6, 4 to 6 is... It is impossible for those who fall under the description of 4 and 5, verse 6, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance. And likewise, in chapter 10, equally strongly, verse 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire. Now, in this session, we will focus primary attention on the first of the two most extensive warning passages, this one that I have just read. And we will proceed by asking four questions and trying to answer them. Number one, what in general 
leads to apostasy? What, in general, leads to apostasy? As emphasized in this book, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Now, it's worth observing that there is a fairly rare word that occurs in 511 and in 612. That is in the opening verse of the section and in the closing verse of the section. It forms, in other words, a literary inclusio, the device of inclusion, a literary envelope, which, which suggests that the whole passage, you see, is to be read under those themes. That word is nothroi, and it can be rendered sluggish or thick, perhaps lazy, but lazy in your hearing. We have much to say about this, and it is hard to explain because you are sluggish to hear, literally, slow to learn. Or again, down in chapter 6, verse 12, we do not want you to become no throy, sluggish, thick. What then is it that prompts this sluggishness, this inability, this culpable inability to hear, to listen? And when you read verses 11 to 14, apart from some um, disputed details here and there that we'll take a look at in a moment, the heart of the issue simply is immaturity in listening to, studying, absorbing, and conforming to the Word of God. It is as simple as that. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word. You need milk. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with such and such. We'll come to that. But solid food is for the mature. In other words, what leads to this, to this terrible state of affairs in this context is inattentiveness to the Word of God. That should not surprise us. Do you remember how Psalm 1 begins? Psalm 1, of course, is a wisdom psalm, so it presents just two ways. The righteous person is described negatively in verse 1, positively in verse 2, and metaphorically in verse 3. That's the righteous person. And then you get verses 4 and 5, the unrighteous person, and then a kind of final summarizing contrast, a very simple structure to the psalm. So negatively, the first verse tells us what a righteous person is not like. Blessed is the man who does not walk according to the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. Verse 2, you might have accepted, expected, because so much Hebrew poetry is built on parallelism, you might have expected, blessed rather is the man who walks the counsel of the righteous and stands in the way of the just and sits in the seat of the praising. That's not what you get. When the righteous person is described positively, there's only one criterion. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Or recall that quite remarkable passage in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, the last three verses, 18 to 20, where Moses looks forward to the time when there will be a king in Israel. And he prescribes the first order of business for such a king. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, we're told he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. A remarkable passage, is it not? He becomes king, what's the first thing he's supposed to do? Audit the books of the predecessor? Nope. Appoint a new, um, a new secretary of state? Nope. Call a cabinet meeting? Nope. It's to get out his quill pen and copy out by hand a copy of this law, which either refers to Deuteronomy or the whole of the Pentateuch. It doesn't mean to download it from a CD onto the hard drive <laughs> without it passing through his brain. Or nowadays, you can download it from your hard drive into, into an iPad. Or, I got my whole Greek New Testament in here and a whole lot of other stuff. You see, I, I, I didn't have to read a word of it when I did that. Not a single blessed word. 
If it depends on, on knowing the Greek Testament that, that, uh, that, that I downloaded it from my hard drive into here, I didn't learn a thing. Nope, had to do it by hand. And so clearly that that would become his Bible, which he was thereafter to read day after day after day after day, all the days of his life, thinking God's thoughts after him. So he would learn to revere God's words and to not think of himself better or turn to the left or to the right. If only those three verses of all of the Pentateuch had been carefully observed, all of Old Testament history would have been massively different. Or think of a passage like Deuteronomy 8. God puts the people of Israel through the desert that they shall learn that man does not live by bread only, that is, but by, from our necessary food, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And in the context of Hebrews, what this means is the reader should have already been thinking through their scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, in line with the way the author is expounding these themes. He's really treating them in such a way as to say, come off it, by this time you don't know this stuff? Give me a break. Do you see? Isn't that what he's saying? It's important to remember that the milk metaphor in Scripture is used differently in different passages. Don't make it all, all the same. You, you, won't, you won't hear the texts well. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, for example, Peter writes, Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. The idea is not that all of his readers are immature. There, the use of, of the milk metaphor is to show the kind of craving you should have toward the Word of God. There's no, there's, there's no distinction there between milk and solid food. You know, th those of us who have had babies know that when they get a little hungry, the way they go after that milk is something else. My, my, my wife struggled to, 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 to breastfeed, if I'm allowed to, to say that here, and she had some medical problems, wasn't allowed to do it, and he, eventually after our baby had gone down to five and a half pounds, our first one, we gave up on that and we switched to formula. By this time, she was miserable, crying, whining all the time, whinging, one miserable little baby, we thought, well, boy, we got one of these. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, once we switched to formula and she could get all that she wanted to, you know, you brought that nipple anywhere close to <laughs> And bliss. <laughs> Just sucked and sucked and sucked. Besides, my wife had had, had an emergency C-section, and that meant I could take all over all the, all the feedings at that point, you know? And she was a dream. I get up, change her diet. Well, I already had the formula made up. Zapped eight ounces in the microwave. I could change her, get her down. Eight ounces, glug, 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 down. I never was up more than 20 minutes when I had to do her. She was wonderful, you know? She craved that pure, well, not so spiritual milk. <laughs> And that's the image, you see. We're, we're, we're to be that hungry for the word of God that it's, it's, it's like a little baby who's just, uh, who's just dying to get that next suck when it's really, really hungry. But then you have a different use, don't you, in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. In that case, Paul is rebuking the Corinthians for saying, I'm, I'm, giving, you, I'm give, giving you milk, not solid meat, because you're not ready for it. In that case, the, the, there's a distinction that is made on the basis of, of, of maturity. And he's bawling them out for not being able to accept greater, more mature teaching after, get this, a five-year gap. That is, the gap between his planning the church and when he writes 1 Corinthians is five years. And he's chewing them out good and proper because they can't take more doctrine a little faster. And that's certainly the kind of usage you get here, too, don't you? You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is still an infant. And the demonstration of this, Paul says, is that they are not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. That is not an easy expression to understand. It can be rendered in several different ways. It could simply mean right speech versus that of the infant, sim simply using the same, um, the, 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 the same metaphor a little farther. The word of righteousness, literally, in Greek, with understanding the genitive, in that case, to be a genitive of definition. Or it could be an ethical emphasis. The NEB has what is right, or some have moral standard, or something like that. 
But I suspect that the NIV, which I'm reading from, the teaching about righteousness, is probably right. That is, it's the teaching about righteousness, the teaching of the Christian faith, the Christian religion, with Christ as our righteousness, as explained from the Old Testament texts themselves, properly understood. That's what the book has been about, you see? And anybody who's really immature, and their kind of immature, with their kind of immaturity, wants to go back to the Old Testament types and clearly doesn't understand the real teaching about righteousness in those texts that point us to Christ, our righteousness. Christ who achieves what needs to be achieved and presents us righteous before God. One must understand that there is a huge moral dimension to all this nevertheless. For we read at the end of verse 14, the mature, by constant use, that is, of Scripture, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That's not just good from evil in a moral sense, but also good from evil, I think, in the context, in a discernment sense, in a sense of understanding what Scriptures really do teach. That turns, in substantial part, on being good readers of Scripture, studying the Word again and again and again and again. It's, it's, it's why people like you are at a conference like this. So that's the first question. What, in general, leads to apostasy? And the answer is, in one fashion or another, a neglect of the Word of God. And that, of course, has wide, wide resonance in Scripture and in our age, does it not? The prophets denounce the judgment that comes when there is a famine of the Word of God. One of the greatest characteristics of contemporary evangelicalism is a decline in Bible knowledge, a decline in family and personal Bible reading. And in the culture at large, there's certainly a massive rise of biblical ignorance. I could tell you stories that would, uh, that, that, that would sizzle your ears be because so much of, of, of the evangelism I do is in university campuses and the like. I had one of my students go to downtown Chicago with his fiancée a few months back, and she was wearing a gold chain with a little wooden cross suspended from it. A teenager stopped her in the street and said, uh, what are you wearing a plus sign around your neck for? <laughs> Let me tell you, when I do university evangelism, I always do it with, uh, with exposition. And nobody has a Bible, of course, so you have to print out the relevant text and give a copy to each one when they come in. I, I begin by explaining the big numbers and the little numbers. They don't know anything. They don't know anything. I was on a TV set three or four years ago for the Discovery Channel for a couple of couple of days for a religious program they were doing. I was the token evangelical. We do get in now once in a while. <laughs> and for that two days, there were about 30 people on the crew, and I think I spoke to all of them. I think I spoke to all of them. I didn't find one. Well, I did find one. One out of the 30 that knew the Bible had two testaments. And that one was, in fact, the young woman who was the interviewer who was slated to read, to, to ask me questions. And she came up and said to me, you know, because of this assignment, I've been studying the Bible now for about six weeks, and I think I've got a handle on it. <laughs> Boy, was I impressed. You, you realize that the level of biblical illiteracy nowadays is really massive. It, it really is shockingly massive. My daughter is in a literature class, a Shakespeare class, and she's just taking on the side. It's not part of her course at university, but she loves Shakespeare, so she added this as an extra course. And, and in the course of this course, um, inevitably discussion came up about this metaphor or that metaphor, all deeply biblically related, and she was pulling them out, you know. Everybody thinks she's a brilliant whiz kid. She's not. She's a perfectly average student. She just reads her Bible. Here, then, is the origins of a great deal of apostasy. Number two. What in this specific case leads to apostasy? What in this specific case leads to apostasy? Chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. 
This is not an easy paragraph, but fortunately, whichever way of the two main ways you take it, the general thrust is the same. So although it's not an easy paragraph, in fact, it doesn't matter too much. The general thrust turns out to be the same. The issue is this. Are the six things which the author here lists as belonging to the elementary teachings about Jesus, are they essentially Jewish things or essentially elementary Christian things? And I have to tell you, I've gone back and forth on that one again and again and again, because you can make a very good case both ways. The short answer is I don't know. I tip toward the Jewish side, but I'm not positive. Let me mention some reasons for uh, taking the text as I do, but I acknowledge that this is somewhat disputed, and then at the end I'll point out that in one sense it doesn't matter to the argument. There is, there is a bit of Greek that has to be explained. At the end of the first uh, uh, clause of verse 6, the NIV has let us go on to maturity not laying again, and so on, so on. Let us go on to maturity. In fact, the Greek is a passive verb. It's not let us do something, but rather, quite literally, and it can only be taken as a passive, this is not a deponent anywhere in the ancient literature, let us be born along to perfection. Let us be born along to maturity. That is, let us be born along by God to maturity. It's a divine passive, as they used to be called. But that means that when you get down to verse 3, and you read, and God permitting, we will do so, we will do so almost certainly does not refer back to that passive. You know, let us be born along, we will do so, probably not. It's probably referring back to the first verb of verse 6. I think what that means is, Therefore, let us leave in place, leave standing, leave where they are, the elementary teachings about Christ, and be born along by God to maturity, not laying again all this stuff mentioned in the next two verses, and God permitting, this is what we'll do. That is, we'll leave these things standing where they are and go on. I think that's what the argument is. Now, what are these things? What is interesting about them is that each of the six items mentioned in verses 1 and 2 is tied in some way to the high priestly Christology of the following chapters. It's really quite stunning. For example, the call to repentance from dead works and to faith in God, chapter 9. Verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, that is from dead works, do you see? So that we may serve the living God. And those acts that lead to death are, I think, from verse 10, the external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Or again, the discriminations about useless washings, compare chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, where the real cleansing of the conscience is unpacked. And again, 9, 19, and again, 10, 22. Or the laying on of hands, I think what is at stake here is the laying on of hands in the formal ordination of Old Testament priests over against the peculiar way in which the New Testament priest comes to power by the oath of God Almighty. I think that's the distinction that is being made. Nevertheless, the particular answer to the question can be put in pretty general terms. What is this in this specific case leads to apostasy? In this specific case, case, judging by the whole book and not just by these verses, there is a desire to go back to the old rites, the old traditions, the old covenant in such a way that their true pointing to Christ 
is not seen, so that one is fixating on the types and not the antitypes. One is fixating on the old covenant and does not see how it is pointing to the new which is now dawned. And as a result, the, the effect of all of this is to relativize the exclusive sufficiency of Christ and all his work. In that sense, it's a kind of variation of the Galatian heresy, do you see? What it does is, in effect, dismiss the sufficiency of Christ. Now, we are not likely to have exactly the same error today, although, although there is a particular form of this one that comes very close. I teach at a seminary where uh, oh, we have something like 1,400 students, I guess, and, and because we're on the far north side of metro Chicago, we, we attract a fair number of converted Jews, Messianic Jews, and so on. And Messianic Jews can fall into quite a lot of different categories these days. It's very interesting. And some of them have started uh, certain kinds of Messianic congregations where, at least initially, they start out for evangelistic purposes to observe kosher food laws and this sort of thing so that they can invite their more orthodox Jewish friends and neighbors in places like Buffalo Grove, where the population is about 60% Jewish, to, to, to their churches, their services, and this sort of thing, and, 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 and they'll feel comfortable. They, they can be invited into their home, and they're not going to be worrying about whether or not some pots are used for both, for, 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 for both um, uh, uh, meat and, and dairy, do, 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 do you see? They, 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 are, they are careful to observe kosher everything. And likewise, they observe Jewish Passover and, and so on, so on, so on. But now some of them go a little further and say, this is the right thing for Christian Jews to do. It's, it, it's not the right thing for, for Christian Gentiles to do. Now, as soon as it becomes the right thing, that is the obligated thing, I begin to worry whether they got hold of the gospel at all. You see, if they want to do it as a matter of flexibility for the sake of evangelism, they've got very good warrant with the Apostle Paul himself, who's quite prepared to circumcise a Timothy so that there will not be any unnecessary umbrage and quite prepared to observe temple rites in Jerusalem and, and so on, b b because they are not significant, they're not binding, and he's just, taking away, he's just taking away any possible umbrage. But he himself says, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. In other words, the new covenant's already in place. Don't kid yourself. So it's just a matter of flexibility. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he does not see himself as a Christian Jew who has to flex to become a Gentile. Rather, he sees himself in what the theologians call the tertium quid, the third place, the third position. So he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those under the law, he became as one under the law. And then to the Gentiles, to those without the law, he became as one. So you see, he's not a Christian Jew who has to flex to get those wretched Gentiles in. He's in a third position. He's a Christian, and he's got to flex this way, and he's got to flex that way. And because of that, you see, there's a good case to be made for those who wish then to, 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 to observe kosher laws in order to win Jews. That, that, that's fine. But as soon as you start saying that puts you on an inside track or that that's necessary for un any part of the people of God, I begin to wonder if you've understood Galatians and you've understood uh, um, uh, 1 Corinthians and if you've understood Hebrews and you've understood half the New Testament, in fact. Because what is finally at stake is the exclusive sufficiency of Christ and his new covenant and the proper relationship of that to the announcement of the typological prediction of the old. Now we come to the heart of the issue, third question, what is apostasy? Verses 4 to 8. Well, I'm sure that this august crowd knows what the options are in interpretive history as well as I do. Some people argue that this is simply loss of one's salvation. One is genuinely saved truly, honestly saved, as saved as any other saved person, and then one loses one's salvation. We were reminded of Tulip this morning by Ed Moore in his able address. You know what the flower of the Arminian is. It's the daisy. I'm sure you know that. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. It's not kind, but it is funny. <laughs> 
in this case, of course, it doesn't even quite work here because you pluck one of those petals and that's it. <laughs> Once you've got to he loves me, he loves me not, there's no he loves me. So that if, if this text does mean that, then you must conclude that the New Testament allows that genuinely converted people can be lost. Now, I would want to argue that that flies in the face of so many New Testament texts. It's a non-starter going in. Some people say, yes, yes, we agree with that, but if we only had this passage all by itself, if we only had Hebrews all by itself, then, 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 then we might come out with that conclusion legitimately. And I would say I'm not even convinced by that. Because before you get to Hebrews chapter 6, you've got to read Hebrews chapter 3. And there we saw that one of the essential definitions of a genuine believer is perseverance to begin with. We'll come back to those texts again in a few moments. If I were in certain conferences at which I speak, I would spend a lot more time justing the view, justifying the view that one cannot in the New Testament genuinely lose one's salvation. I won't try to justify it to this particular crowd since this would be a rather terrible case of bringing coals to Newcastle, I'm quite sure. Some people think this refers simply to what might be called I don't, ordinary backsliding. Is any backsliding ordinary? And th that, that is backsliding without losing one's salvation. The trouble is the sanctions sound far too severe. Others say that this means falling from service, falling from usefulness and fruitfulness, so that it, 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 it's such severe backsliding that the person will never be able to have public function, public service, public utility in the church ever again. Well, I have no doubt that there are some forms of public sin where that should be the result for the very simple reason that one of the criteria for Christian leadership is credibility. According to 1 Timothy 3, the Christian elder, bishop, pastor is supposed to have a good reputation with outsiders and, and, and be blameless, not in the sense of being perfect, but not guilty of any sort of public thing for which everybody blames him and so on. It's the credibility issue with both insiders and outsiders. When people ask questions, can a person who's committed adultery ever return to pastoral ministry? The real issue is not whether or not adultery is the unforgivable sin. The question is credibility. That's the issue. Now, how you work that issue out might be disputed here and there, but that is the nature of the issue. The trouble with trying to read that sort of analysis into this text, however, is the severity of the judgment. This does not say, it is impossible for those who have fallen in this fashion ever to resume public leadership again. That's a very tame reading of this passage. And, and, and even if you could get away with it here, there's no way you can get away with it in chapter 10. All that remains is a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. This is not talking, you see, about temporal judgments. Others argue that this is merely theoretical. Now, uh, theoretical, perhaps for a good purpose. Tom Schreiner, for example, has a long article where he says that it's theoretical so that by the power of the threat, people then do persevere. So that it is the threat, admittedly, finally, theoretical, which, in fact, God uses in order to, 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 to bring people to the place of perseverance. And that, they say, explains the confidence the writer has at the end of the section. When you turn to verse 9, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. This shows that all along the author really thinks these people are going to make it, thank you very much. And, and, and therefore, the, the threat surely is, is, is only theoretical. In fact, the, a propagutic, it, it is a way of, of leading people to, to, to understand the truth and, and encourage them toward perseverance. But with all respect, the threat has no power whatsoever, absolutely no power at all, if everybody knows it's merely theoretical. At the end of the day, that really sounds like a very clever pastoral cop-out. <laughs> 
Uh, we still have to understand what verse 9 is saying, but, but how do you go along making threat and threat and threat and threat and threat where one of the fundamental doctrines is that you can't lose your salvation in any case? You know, you teach you can't lose your salvation, you can't lose your salvation, you can't lose your salvation. Jesus knows the sheep. No one can pluck them out of his hand. All of the fathers given to me will come to me. You go on and on and on and on, and oh, by the way, watch out that you don't lose it. And that's the way you'll stay in. I don't think so. I mean, that, that is just such bad logic to begin with that although that position is espoused by some very good people, I find it finally totally unbelievable. It's, it's, like, it's like parents, you see, who give threats and threats and threats and threats when the kids know perfectly well that the parents are never going never gonna to make good on it. They're old softies. You think the really kids, the kids are going to listen to the threats? No. No, and there are one or two other options. So now let me simply tell you the truth. <laughs> yes, it, it was a joke. Uh, uh, not that the truth is ever a joke, but because, um, because uh, at the end of the day, in disputed subjects, you must be convinced by the text and not by the preacher, no matter who the preacher is. And, and therefore, when, um, when you come across a passage that is massively disputed, you really must listen very, very carefully and, and, not, uh, and not simply uh, uh, buy any particular authoritative opinion as, um, as, as binding. Nevertheless, I will tell you in my view what the heart of the issue is, how I understand it, how I've understood it for years. Go back to chapter 3, verse 6 and verse 14. Christ, we are told, is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. That is, part of the essential definition of what constitutes us as Christ's house is perseverance. Verse 14, we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first the same emphasis. We saw it yesterday in John 8, 30 and 31. We saw it in Colossians 1, 21 to 23. But there are many other passages. Jesus says, he who endures to the end will be saved, for example. And then the remarkable passage in 1 John 2, 19, which indicates that those who abandoned the church, those who left, indicated by their going that they could not possibly have originally been truly of it, but their going showed that they were not of it. If they had truly been of it, they would have remained. In other words, it seems in all of these cases, the New Testament writers, including the writer of the Epistle of the Hebrews, insist that genuine saving grace, by definition, perseveres. But that means, then, that where you get a case like this one that does not persevere, you do not, by definition, have persevering grace. Now, the difficulty with that interpretation, it seems to me, is precisely the five things that are then listed. These people were once enlightened. They tasted of the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. They tasted the good word of God, and they tasted the powers of the coming age. And at face value, truly, to belong to all of these wonderful things surely marks you out as a Christian, doesn't it? But that's where I'm not convinced. I'm really not convinced. I'm, I'm encouraged, brother. I'm not convinced. And the reason I'm not convinced is partly because of biblical examples and biblical passages, but partly also because already in this book, the author has made a very careful distinction between those who were saved from exodus and slavery and those who actually got into the promised land. In other words, it was possible for a whole generation to be saved from, and thus in that sense, to, 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 to participate in salvation and its benefits, but not to get into the promised land, do you see? And when you start looking around in the Bible, you can find a fair number of examples of that sort of thing, can't you? 
there, there, there is Judas. He, he stands among the twelve, and he's performing miracles with the best of them and preaching the good news of the kingdom. And when Jesus sends out people on the trainee mission, then, then when they come back, according to Luke chapter 10, Jesus says, I saw, I saw Satan fall as an angel from heaven and, then, and, and so on. Uh, except in your case, Judas, I mean, none of, nothing of what you did was any good. I mean, is that what he says? I don't think he's got that footnote in there, do, do, do you see? And, and, uh, and then you, you have the parable of the sower, um, with seed falling on stony ground. But stony ground in Palestine is, is earth with limestone bedrock not far under the soil. And, and so when the seed falls in it, because it's such shallow dirt, then in the spring sunshine, that dirt warms up the fastest and the seed there germinates the quickest. But then the first rains stop, the latter rains don't come for a few months. The, the, the roots look down to try to find uh, moisture, they hit the limestone bedrock and the plant keels over and dies. How does Jesus interpret this? It's his parable after all. He says, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And the point is, you see, not only do they seem converted, they seem to be the most promising of the crop. <coughs> they have life in some sense. They, they, they grow, they germinate, they grow. The plant is there, it has life. But because, in fact, they never finally bear fruit, then Jesus lumps them with those where the seed is taken away, snatched away by the devil before it germinates at all, and so on, do you see so there is a whole category, it seems to me, in the New Testament for people who receive something of the blessings of the kingdom, who do taste something of the powers of the age to come. After all, have we not seen people under conviction by the Holy Spirit wrestling with their sins and turning from their sins and, and, and changing and, and, and so on, and yet not converted? Haven't you seen people like that? I mean, I've seen people the other way where they're wretched sinners and they're under great conviction of sin, but they don't do anything about it. And then suddenly, bang, they're transformed and their lives turn around overnight. But we've also seen other people, haven't we, in ministry, where, 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 where the gospel is doing something to them. You know, they, 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 the language gets cleaned up a wee bit and, and they, they they sort of cut down some of the, 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 the violent stuff at home, and, and they're, they're feeling guilty about this or that or the other. And They might actually become quite upright, but they're still not converted. They go a little farther. They might actually make out to be converted, especially if they want to marry one of the girls in the church or one of the girls wants to marry one of the fellows in the church and, 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 and so on. It's surprising how far people can go. After all, the Holy Spirit does his work of conversion, so in that sense, uh, of, of conviction, so in that sense, they become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then the Holy Spirit falls on Saul in the Old Testament. What happens to him? No wonder Paul, uh, uh, David then cries out, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Or what do we do with a Simon Magus? He believed and was baptized, we're told. And then Peter eventually rounds on him and says, your money perish with you. J.B. Phillips once wrote, apart from the fact that you couldn't say this because of what uh, the expression means to us today, literally that should be rendered to hell with you and your money. That's exactly what it means. Even though the man had believed and was baptized. Or what do we do with John 2, 23 to 25? Many believed in him. The verb pistuo, plus ace, plus the accusative. Same that is used for all kinds of expressions of genuine faith. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. He didn't need anybody to tell him what was there. It wasn't, it wasn't a genuine conversion. No, it seems to me that this is not the instance of falling away of a teenager who's left home and is still sorting himself out, coming to intellectual maturity. Nor is this the case of temporarily rebelling and knowing deep down it's a terrible thing to do and fighting it for five years, ten years, and repenting and coming back. This is the case of someone who has been brought close enough to taste something of the transforming grace of God, seeing what the gospel truly is, understanding it, believing it, being in some measure cleaned up by it. And then, because there is no grace of perseverance, because that's not a component of their faith, 
They look it straight in the eyeball, see it for what it is, and say, ah, it's hellish and demonic, I'll walk away from it. I think, you see, that it is, in fact, the equivalent of what Jesus warns about with respect to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, where he himself says, there will not be sins forgiven in that case. It's not, because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is worse than blasphemy against the Son, since the Holy Spirit is of a higher order than the Son. That's not the point. The, the, the point is that, that, that all of us who have begun in the world have criticized the Son or slanderously spoken of the Son or, 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 or whatever as, 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 as part of the steps that have brought us to the gospel. But to come so close to seeing that this is the work of God, it is the work of God the Holy Spirit transforming, converting, changing, cleaning up to taste of the powers of the age to come, to be this close, to see, experience, know, and then self-consciously to say, no. I dismiss this as Beelzebub and walk away. There is no more repentance. Now, it does not follow that we will always have a good idea of what particular case a person is in. You can't just go through life saying, well, in that case it's backsliding, in this case it's a apostasy, in this case it's never genuinely converted at all, just immaturity. And it is, unless you have a lot more gift of discernment than I have, I don't think you're going to find it all that easy in pastoral life. But it seems to me that there are enough accumulative texts in the New Testament that preserve this category for special danger. In the Synoptic Gospels, it's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Here, it's this. In 1 John 5, which I think is a similar sort of case, a different doctrinal issue, but a similar sort of case, there are some sins unto death about which one should not pray. I take it then that apostasy in this passage is that special kind of self-removal from where one stood, such that after having already enjoyed all of the five blessings listed in verses 4 and 5, one self-consciously, knowledgeably, determinedly, and forever rejects the gospel, and one is damned. Last, then, what prevents apostasy? What prevents apostasy? Let me be much quicker here. I would like to say more, but my time's gone. Verses 9 to 12. When the author says, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, it is important not to read too much into what he says. All he is saying is, at this juncture, we remain sure that in your case, um, you're not there yet. You, you see, he is saying, at this juncture, he's sure that they haven't got there. He is not saying, I'm absolutely certain that there's no way this is ever going to happen to you, so I've just wasted my breath. D don't read too much into verse 9. In fact, there's a kind of anguish built into it, the kind of thing you get in the Apostle Paul, too, don't you, sometimes, when, when, when he can say some blistering things to the Galatians and then say in chapter 4 about verse 19, I, I wish I were there. I feel like a woman in travail having to bring forth her, her children all over again. I wish I were there. I, I, I would know whether or not to change my voice, he says, to make it a little softer, to make it a little harder. You see, in those days you wrote a letter, and it could be weeks, even months, before you got a reply. Nowadays you bash out an email, and it comes come zipping back, or... It, 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 might, it, might actually, it might actually be interactive. Or you can get on the phone, you can hear the person's tone of voice, do you see? But with those letters, you don't know whether to push harder. Okay, they've got the lesson now, now I can go softly. Or, 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 or perhaps you've got to push a little harder, they still haven't got it. You get the same sort of agony in the apostle in 2 Corinthians, don't you? And, and you get the same sort of agony in the apostle in, in, in Galatians. And here you get a similar sort of ag agony. On the one hand, very, very stern warnings, because he does not finally know how it's all going to come out. 
Though on the other hand, at this point, he's still confident that they're okay. He still doesn't know how it's all going to come out at the end. But having said that, the things that give confidence, the things that prevent apostasy are, first, there will be no lack in the grace of God, verse 10. There will be no lack in the grace of God. And it gives the writer some great confidence that, after all, these people have suffered for the gospel's sake, and God is no man's debtor. And, and they, they have shown the things that accompany salvation. And, and, and so there will be no lack in the grace of God. That's a ground for confidence. And, and secondly, he says, there must be no lack in diligent perseverance on their part. Verse 11, so he encourages them to this again in verse 11. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. Isn't that a lovely expression? In English, as you well know, hope has uncertainty built into it. The reason why the... Um, the reason why there's no uh, Q&A tomorrow for me is because tonight I'm leaving for Philadelphia. I start some council meetings tomorrow morning at 8.30. So I could tell you I, I, I hope to get to Philadelphia before midnight. Whether I make it or not depends a bit on how lead-footed Fred Zaspel is. Um, but, 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 I, but I hope to get to Philadelphia to, 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 the, to the Warwick Hotel by, by about midnight give or take. But when I say I hope to, implicitly I'm saying it, but I fully recognize I might not. You might get a flat tire. You might fall asleep at the wheel. We might leave too late. Who knows what will happen, you see? In English, hope always involves a measure of insecurity and uncertainty. But in Greek thought, hope looks to the future without any overtone whatsoever as to whether it will certainly happen or not certainly happen. Everything depends then on the context. So that in some contexts, hope has a measure of uncertainty built in because of the context. But in other places, the, 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 the New Testament writers can speak of our certain hope, which is in English an oxymoron. But it's not an oxymoron in Greek. Because it's this anticipation of the future, and, and that future is absolutely certain. So, so then, with the grace of God in verse 10, and the due diligence that works out in, in, in anticipation of the blessings to come, we, we have a certain hope, you see. We want to make this anticipation absolutely certain. And then, similarly, there must be no failure to imitate the best Christian models. We do not want you to become lazy, to, but to imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit what has been promised. And that theme, of course, is unpacked at considerable length in chapter 13. I wish I had time to deal with it, but I don't. I conclude. The reference to the inheritance that has been promised in verse 12 leads the author back to the theme of promise in verses 13 and following. You see, verse 12 says that um, we are to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. What promise? when God made his promise to Abraham, and that has brought us back to the fundamental salvation promise of the Old Covenant Scriptures. Namely, that in Abraham and in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that was finally sealed with a ratification covenantal seminar uh, seminary. It must be getting late. A ceremony um, in, in chapter 15, right after the Melchizedek passage. And it is to that ceremony that the author returns in chapter 9, which we'll see in the second section. Therefore, um, when God swore this promise, he swore by himself for all the reasons that I gave last night, to increase our faith. And that, too, then lends toward perseverance. God took the pains of not only giving a promise, but swearing by himself, because there was no greater, precisely so that we would believe this promise and thus be driven to perseverance. Look at all that God has done to make us persevere. Do you see? He not only pours out his spirit upon us, he not only sends his son, he's given these promises precisely so that we will live with eternity's values in view and not think of salvation as sort of a, a little benefit here that one can take or leave or pick or choose from, but one builds for all 
Holy Trinity on a faith that is enduring, a faith that perseveres. That's why this passage is also in anticipation, you see, of the great faith chapter in Hebrews, 13, uh, Hebrews 11, where faith is portrayed as, as that which intrinsically, if it's saving faith, which intrinsically perseveres and perseveres and perseveres and perseveres. And we have all the grounding for that, for God himself has promised. God himself has taken an oath. This is the whole direction of things. How certain can you be after all? Therefore, we have great hope. We have this hope, verse 19, this anticipation, absolutely sure. And it becomes thus for us an anchor for us. And then in a glorious mixed metaphor, the anchor goes behind the veil. And normally anchors go down in the sea, but it's almost as if the rhetoric of the man is escaping him now, and he mixes up his metaphors, and, and the anchor goes behind the veil, and then the anchor is suddenly Jesus. So the anchor is Jesus behind the veil, and if Jesus is behind the veil, it's got to be because he's high priest and we're back at Melchizedek again. And thus, you see, this business of Christian assurance and Christian apostasy is not supposed to be something first and foremost that one fights over to get the technical details right. It's supposed to be an incentive to persevere because of the certainty of all of God's promises, the blessed grace, the graciousness of his oath, the, the finality of Christ's cross work as the high priest, the certainty of the whole plan of God across the sweep of scriptures so that we have certain hope. Amen.